no again saying that Nigeria as an economy is endowed with natural resources that can be harnessed to assist and promote national economic growth and development. The significant impact of tourism on social, political and economic development could not be overemphasized due to its contributions in the areas of poverty alleviation, attainment of the Millennium Development Goals, Financial System Strategy 2020 and national economic sustenance. However, this sector seems not to be getting the desired attention and yet the government is talking about diversifying the economy. For instance, when we look at the GDP data that was released recently, tourism is lumped together with arts, entertainment and recreation, which contributed just 0.20% to the GDP in the fourth quarter of 2019 and 0.23% in the full year 2019. Why so? We are being joined on the show by the founder and the president, Lacampine Tropicana, Wanli Akimbaboye. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Akimbaboye. Thank you for having me. By the way, should we even be talking about um, travel and tourism now that we have coronavirus ravaging the world? Well, it depends on what you mean by travel. I traveled <laughs> here from the resort. Uh, people are traveling. They're, they're, you, of course, you know, you have domestic tourism. You have international tourism. Now, 62% of all tourism in most countries are usually domestic tourism. Uh, before we start getting to a point where we start panicking about coronavirus, um, I think to a large extent our focus should be looking at what is it that we have not done in the past and what we have to do. We, we, we are so diverse, the fact that um, you have what, approximately 923, 677,000 square kilometers of area. You have 774 local governments, and every single local government in Nigeria is capable of beating Kenya in the area of natural resources. So I think to a large extent, as soon as we have one small issue, we think that, okay, let's not talk about tourism now. <laughs> now, I hope you know there's medical tourism. There are people that travel for medical reasons. Mm. There's business tourism. There's adventure tourism. You have... Um, Leisure tourism. I see mainly when we talk about tourism, most people talk more about leisure tourism. But there are so many segments of tourism. Uh, there's war tourism. Rwanda took a million heads of the genocide and they displayed it and people travel from all over the world to see it. So I really feel our focus should be about what we have not done and what we need to do to transform this to, I believe tourism is bigger than any industry in this country. Everything you have mentioned mm. from oil is a byproduct of tourism. I mean, petroleum is a byproduct of tourism because if you're traveling from, let's talk about international travel now, you need aviation fuel. When you land, you need petro petrol to move. If I bring a million people to Lagos, Nigeria, for example, that is going to put a lot of pressure on petroleum. That will move them from uh, the airport to La Campagne Tropicana mm. <laughs> <laughs> and any other resort, any other hotel they decide to go to. And when they go for leisure, they, so petroleum is actually a byproduct of tourism, of tourism because tourism is about movement, travel from point A to point B. If you travel domestically, it's referred to as domestic tourism. When you cross the border, it makes absolutely no difference the distance. If you leave, for example, in Badagri, and it takes you like 15 minutes to cross to Benin, mm. you're an international mm -hmm. tourist. Mm -hmm. So we need to first of all have a clear understanding what we're talking about when we say in tourism. <laughs> now, health tourism, medical tourism mm. is also mega. Uh, we do that traveling urban. We need to look at how we can have inbound tourism, weaved around medical tourism. Mm. Okay, so what is it that we are not doing right? Well, it has not really occurred to us, the importance of tourism. When you have a country, small country like Jamaica, approximately 11,000 approximately square kilometers of area, they have about 2.9 million people and they get approximately 4,400 tourists mm. per annum. 
and you don't want to go to the mega guys like the United States of America that got about 77 million tourists last year. You don't want to refer to, if we talk about countries like Dubai, uh, Dubai is only 4,114. They took 70 kilometers of area and they receive approximately 15.9 million tourists every year. 15.9 million. And they are just 3,000, uh, 3 million, 300 people, approximately. Actually, the Emiratis are just about 650,000. But they naturalized Indians, Chinese, and so many other. And they got 3.3. And they get 15.9 million tourists every year. Now, earlier on, you talked about the fact that 62% of domestic tourism, and domestic tourism actually makes up 62%. But would you of say most. that is the case in Nigeria, knowing fully well that Nigerians travel a lot for leisure, for medical tourism and the likes? Well, if you put everything together, really, what tourism is about. If you travel, for example, from here to Ife, to go to school, or you to go, go for a lecture, you are called an educational tourist. tourist. If you go to Ibadan for treatment, you're called a domestic medical tourist. Uh, so if we harvest and harness the total number of people that are traveling domestically, it's just that we don't have these data. You know, <laughs> when you Google and want to find out what happened, for example, in France, uh, last year, France did 40 million tourists last year. And they have a total, just a population of about 56 million people. Uh, you come to Nigeria to get the data, you find that uh, they will give you a range. They said that uh, maybe between 1914 and 2020, <laughs> uh, they give, you know, because we don't have correct data. We need to really understand what is happening in the Nigerian tourism sector by first of all harvesting, harnessing, confirming, determining what we're getting from domestic tourism first and stop focusing on leisure travelers. There's adventure tourism, there's archaeological tourism, there's business tourism. This is just endless. So, but we've got to harvest that first. Identify what uh, domestic tourism is all about and how many we are getting domestically? How many people are traveling from, from Lagos to Onitsha every day? How many people are coming from Bini to Lagos every day to do business? They are part of our tourism statistics that we've got to get. Then before we start talking about international tourists, mm. now we have a primary target market audience of approximately 2 point, uh, 200, what, what is it? What is our population? 240, 250 million people today. We are 923, 677, thousand square kilometers of area large. And then we have our primary target market audience, that is Nigeria. Then we have the secondary target market audience, that is the entire West African subregion and the rest of the African continent even for business stories, because everybody believes that if they come to Lagos or come to Nigeria, they'll do well. Mm. So even if we harness and we focus on business tourists alone, from the secondary target market audience, you have 55 countries, African countries, that can patronize us. Before we start talking about the extended target market audience, which is the world audience, but before you do that, start from the domestic primary target market audience, go to the secondary target market audience, then go to the extended target market audience. And I'm sure if we're able to do that, we'll begin to see how much tourism is. I'll give a little example. In an area where La Campagne is built, uh, when we got there, we had maybe five, six, ten concrete houses. T today, there are about 2,000. All right, they used to have five, 10 fishing boats. Today, it's countless fishing boats, okay? Now, the economy has exploded, but we're really not capturing these statistics. We're not looking at what is it we are doing, where is our strength? We, we need to do a SWOT analysis to see what we have to do. And 
I tell you, tourism, I've been at it for 36 years. So it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> there were Da Silva, there were so many people before I came into the industry. And there are people like the Clark before I came into the industry. Um, uh, Amakri before I came into the industry. Uh, big fathers in the industry. And there will be more uh, because tourism will outlead any business. You don't run out of it. Mm. There is no entry level for tourism. Mm. You don't have to have a first degree, a master's degree. So if you're looking at mass employment, that is where you begin from. You begin from tourism because everybody can partake in it. The doctors are needed, lawyers are needed, engineers are needed, cooks are needed, uh, anyway, security. From, from, from what you have said, so for there is no doubt that tourism, when we're talking about um, uh, diversifying the economy, there's no doubt that tourism can actually be one aspect the government should be looking into, particularly if you're the talking about... The only aspect. <laughs> Before, you know, Looking I give into, an example. In let terms of you, foreign exchange you, earnings, let me give you an because we keep talking about agriculture all the time. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, looking at the stakeholders like you, yes. okay, we can be talking about, oh, government will need to do this, government would not need to do that. What are you stakeholders also doing? What kind of synergy exists between, you know, you stakeholders? Well, to a large extent, I think tourism has not yet occurred to the government. It hasn't occurred to them mm. yet. And you know, when something has not occurred to you, you have a way of really not taking uh, it into any serious, uh, you know what I mean, <laughs> recognition. Mm. Uh, but my position is if you want to look at, um, you mentioned something earlier, it's very, very key. You mentioned agriculture. Mm. I hope you know that it's only tourism you can have internal export. What do you mean by internal export? Mm. Uh, you take your, let me use a product like, um, let's use um, a commodity like um, banana, for example. Okay. When you export banana or yam, for example, to Europe, you go through so much process, there's so much competition. But if you bring a million people into Nigeria from different parts of the world to eat your banana, number one, you have absolute monopoly, for example. When they come to the resort, they eat what we give them. So your yam. And when people travel, they eat double what they eat when they are at home. So when Dubai, with 3.3 approximately million people, get into their country, 15.9 million tourists, they're actually feeding 30 to 40 million people. What does that do for the agriculture? Hmm. It explodes it. Now, let's leave that for a minute. Cocoa, for example, today is about $2.1 to $2,100 commodities. I don't know if it has fluctuated, uh, but it takes you three years to harvest it. But you get one tourist going to a hotel, going to a resort. That is what he spends in two days. And when he leaves, you don't need to really reconstruct the building. Another person comes in to spend an additional 2.1. And the trickle-down effect will include the kind of people that benefit the value chain to the cleaners at the resort, for example. Most of our cleaners, because they are in a rural environment. We have 774 local governments in Nigeria presently. Because they are in a rural environment, they don't have to worry about paying for transport. They don't have to worry about paying for food. Uh, those of them that are working and they need food, their wards bring food to them at the resort. They've built one, two houses, whilst most of us in Lagos are struggling to pay rent. All right? And that is what we have got to do in all the 774 local governments. And when we do that, we will see the effect of growth that comes from grassroots. Because what you do when you go to a local environment and you create a natural resort in that manner, you bring ambassadors that will connect with the people, the real people, the real people of Nigeria in the 774 local governments. 
But we're still talking about what to do now. Data shows that tourism in South Africa, for instance, created 1.5 million jobs in 2019. In Kenya, it created 1.1 million jobs to the Kenyan economy. Now, what are some of these countries in sub-Saharan Africa doing and the rest of the world? What are they doing differently that Nigeria needs to do? Their government is aware of the importance of tourism. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much you can do as an individual. Yeah, okay. I've been at this for 36 years. There's so much you can do as one man. Uh, but when a government focuses on tourism, things will pick up. Uh, there's, an area in, there's an area in Turkey called Antalya. It was just Nigeria, in Lagos alone, I hope you, you know that you have approximately almost um, 198 kilometers of beachfront. That's how they have it in Antalya. What the mayor did in Antalya was to give people free land, come and build resorts. And when you build, and you can show us your bill of quantities, once you open that resort, they will give you back instantly 50% of your investment. Today, they have half a million beds. They have the largest number of five, six-star resorts in the world. In Ethiopia, for example, when you build a resort and a hotel, everybody, family members, some government officials will come in. Whatever your rate is, they pay double for that day to help you cushion the cost of that investment. Because they know that that investment is going to add value, not only to you, but to the entire community. That is what Kenya has realized. But you know, when you look at Kenya, we all know that when you talk about safari tourism, everybody goes to Kenya. Business tourism, people go to uh, South Africa, for example. Archaeological tourism, people go to Egypt. If you look at all of that, and you look at the numbers you've just given, it's basically because there's a focus by their government, understanding the importance of tourism, and creating the enabling environment, making it possible, mm. making it doable, making people, if you take a few investors in tourism, and you give them tax holidays, you encourage them, you show prosperity with them. You don't need to tell Nigerians, we have a bakery mentality. Bread sells, everybody wants to bake bread. So when they hear that there is a lot of possibilities in terms of revenue that can be generated from tourism, people will flock into it. And that is what you need. It's not just a lone ranger like I'm playing Tropicana <laughs> on one night. You need uh, a thousand people to be involved in the and transformation of an area into a tourism destination. Mm. We have to try. What we've been busy doing is selling attractions. Mm instead of selling destination. Attractions well, does not bring you money. What mm. brings you money is destination. An Maybe. attraction attracts people. They come in, they have $10,000 in their pocket. If you don't weave around that attraction, opportunities, enjoyment, relaxation, they will take that $10,000 and go Come back. back. Mm. But if you weave something around that particular attraction, you have transformed that attraction to a destination. All right, let's just hope we get it right eventually. We have to, we have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, busy. Well, we've been speaking to the founder and the president of La Campan Tropicana, Wanli Akiboboye. Wanli. Wanli. Ola Wanli. Ola Wanli. Yeah. Yeah. Very arrogant <laughs> name. Ola <laughs> Wanli. <laughs> Many thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, Thank you for having me. It's been fun. fun.